Hey folks, I'm JC from OneShotAdventures.com and today I'm going to give you an overview of the free 1980s horror adventure, The Mound in the Yard, and I'll give you some tips and tricks on how to run a horror adventure like a pro. The Mound in the Yard is a free horror adventure designed for three to five players. It can be completed in one or two sessions. There are versions available for Call of Cthulhu and GURPS, but it can easily be ported to any system of your choice. The adventure also includes pre-generated characters and cool handouts, so GMs can prep this adventure without a ton of extra effort. There are some big spoilers ahead, so if you're thinking about playing this adventure, maybe skip the rest of this video and tell your GM to check it out instead. Great, all the players are gone and it's just us game masters. The Mound in the Yard is an investigative horror adventure set in 1981. It's a slow burn. It gives the players lots of time to explore a town, talk to NPCs, investigate clues, and eventually track down the villain of the piece. If your players like high adventure and lots of action and combat, this probably isn't the right adventure for them. It's really designed for players who like to immerse themselves in an investigation. Smoke bomb, you said. <laughs> the setup is this. A mysterious event has lured the players to Nolan's Gap, Tennessee, a small rural town. A young farmhand named Ellis Loudy discovered a strange, rotten mound in his backyard. At first, the locals wrote it off as something ordinary, like a burst sewer pipe or maybe a sinkhole. Ellis, on the other hand, said the mound was riddled with worms and foul-smelling bones, and that it was causing him horrible dreams and nightmares. Over the next few days, Ellis went mad trying to dig up this mound. And a few days later, Ellis was found dead in his backyard by the local sheriff. His corpse unusually decayed. Soon, two more mounds mysteriously appeared in Nolan's Gap. A young couple vanished from their house without a trace. Another man is ranting mad, screaming that he's going to kill anybody who gets near his yard. Recognizing that he's out of his depth, the local town sheriff calls in experts from Nashville. So this setup sounds pretty Lovecraftian. Once the players hear about these strange events, they're going to be all ready for some eldritch horror slithering under town and devouring people alive. But that's the twist. There's no occult horror in this adventure. There's no magic. There's no monsters. The villain is a 1980s style slasher. All right, let's back up a little bit and explain what's going on. The town of Nolan's Gap is known for exactly one thing, the long handle murders. Back in 1971, 10 years before this adventure takes place, a local man named Mitchell Meacham was accused of murdering five of his co-workers at the Brant Broiler Farm, the largest employer in town. Mitchell Meacham was arrested and sentenced to death, where he's still awaiting his execution at the penitentiary. By 1981, the Brant Broiler Farm is running out of money. It's having a hard time competing with Big Chicken. Its owner, an old man named Absalom Brant, hires a young man to turn things around. This man's name is Tucker DeForest, and by this town's standards, he's a big shot. College educated, degree in biochem and pharmaceuticals, he's pretty confident he can turn everything around. Tucker is named head of R&D at the Brant Broiler Farm, and he claims he can create more chickens faster than anyone else. Unfortunately, Tucker's way over his skis. Despite his big degrees, he actually doesn't really know what he's doing, and all of his experiments have led to his bad-tasting chicken. Stress and careless exposure to his own chemicals have altered his brain. He's terrified that he's going to be found out as a fraud, and his mental state got even worse when his longtime girlfriend broke up with him to date somebody younger. Just as Tucker's cracking under this pressure, he hears that Longhandle Mitchell Meacham has escaped prison. He realizes that Longhandle's escape makes the perfect cover-up, and that he can murder those people that he thinks will expose him, and he can just pin the blame on Longhandle. Tucker DeForest is the true villain of the mound in the yard. 
He's unsettled and deranged, but he's just an ordinary killer. As the PCs explore Nolan's Gap, trying to discover what's going on with those strange mounds, they'll uncover the town's dark past. They'll find out that the mounds are just the simple offshoots of Tucker DeForest's experiments run through the town's original 19th century sewer system. But as they're uncovering that mystery, Tucker DeForest will be operating in the shadows, murdering those people that are in his way and eventually coming for the PCs themselves. The adventure kicks off with the PCs arriving in Nolan's Gap. The town sheriff, Bill Dober, asks the PCs to come here. With mounds popping up across town, he's out of his league and he needs some help. So the PCs are likely other law enforcement agents, geologists, or scientists, other experts who can help solve exactly what's going on here in this town. Delayed by traffic, they meet Sheriff Bill at night at an old diner so he can catch them up on the situation. During dinner, the PCs suddenly hear a scream coming from the woods behind the diner. A teenage girl, Casey Bowman, comes running out of the woods, hysterical. She screams that she and her boyfriend were attacked by a man wearing an animal mask and wielding a long knife. Sure enough, the PCs find her quarterback boyfriend nursing a nasty wound in the woods. Sheriff Bill really doesn't have an explanation for this attack. He tells the PCs he'll handle it and urges them to start their investigation on the three mounds that have popped up across town. After this opening, the adventure plays out as a sandbox investigation. There are three mounds to kickstart the case, and each one will lead the PCs deeper into the town's dark secrets. The adventure is very open-ended. There are a lot of places, NPCs, and leads for the players to untangle. I'll walk through a few of them now. The PCs will likely start the investigation at the location of the first mound, the one where Ellis Loudy died. His house is mostly a non-event. They'll probably run into the town drug addict who's squatting in Ellis's house, but there's no obvious clues. Ellis's neighbor gives a straightforward version of the events. Ellis was a nice, normal guy until the mound appeared. Then he went nuts and was obsessed with it until he turned up dead. Ellis's neighbor thinks this has much to do about nothing and that it's simply a broken sewer pipe. If the PCs investigate that lead, they'll discover there's no sewers running under Ellis's property. What they won't know yet is that the mound is actually caused by chemicals running through the town's original sewer system, but this is gonna take a trip to the town archives to really discover. The second mound belongs to Jen and Philip Carlson, a young couple who recently moved back to town. However, they mysteriously disappeared shortly after the mound appeared in their yard. Investigating this house discovers an old ham radio book that refers to the Longhandle murders. Turns out, Philip Carlson's brother was killed by Longhandle back in 1971. And as they're investigating this house, they'll suddenly hear on the radio that Mitchell Longhandle Meacham has escaped prison. They'll no doubt think that the original killer of Nolan's Gap is on the loose. The third mound belongs to a grizzled, jobless, dishonorably discharged veteran named Joe Royce. Joe is often drunk, angry, and he hates strangers. He's going to chase anybody off of his property with a shotgun. Now Joe's hiding a big secret too. Back in 1971, he worked as a truck driver at the Brandt Broiler Farm. When Absalom Brandt told his supervisor, Mitchell Meacham, to pay off health inspectors, Meacham refused. Angry. Absalom paid off Joe Royce to teach Mitchell a lesson. Joe Royce assaulted Meacham, but was caught in the act by employees of the chicken farm. In a fit of rage, he grabbed a long-handled knife and murdered everybody around him. He and Absalom Brandt then framed Mitchell Meacham, who had suffered a head wound from Joe's attack, and he couldn't really explain what had happened at the farm. The PCs can only discover this secret by investigating Joe Royce his friends, his hangouts, and eventually confronting the owner of the farm, Absalom Brandt. Of course, as the PCs get closer to finding out the truth that Joe Royce was the real long handle murderer, he might decide to turn to violence again. As the PCs are snooping around town, paranoid Tucker DeForest will inevitably believe that they're out to expose him starts to watch the PCs, and soon enough he'll decide that they have to go. First, he'll strike at any allies or friends that they've made in town. Then, 
he'll start to come after them, wearing his animal mask and carrying Longhandle's old knife so that people will believe that the real Longhandle is on the loose again. Meanwhile, don't forget that Mitchell Meacham is heading back to town where he wants to settle old scores, specifically by killing Absalom Brandt and Joe Royce for setting him up all those years ago. The adventure likely culminates with the discovery of Tucker DeForest's mishandled chicken experimentation and a four-way showdown between the PCs, Tucker DeForest, Joe Royce, and Mitchell Meacham. The last time I ran this adventure, the PCs ended up bunkered up in an old farmhouse at night. They were there with Mitchell Meacham, who they weren't sure whether or not they could trust. But they convinced him to help them fend off Joe Royce and Tucker DeForest. There was a chainsaw on the wall, there were critical failures. It was actually a pretty good ending to a slasher adventure. <laughs> There's a reason that slasher adventures aren't very common in role-playing games. Slasher movies rely on tropes that role-playing heroes rarely emulate. In a movie like Halloween or Scream, when the hero sees the slasher, they run upstairs and hide in a closet. In a role-playing game, the PCs run out the back door where they've set up a careful trap where all the friends are equipped with shotguns and they blast the villain to bloody shreds. So here's my top three tips to not just run the mound in the yard, but any slasher horror adventure that you might want to try. Tip number one, Game Masters. Keep the fact that you're running a slasher adventure secret from the players until the last possible moment. They'll be expecting Shoggoths and occult books, and instead when they find a maniac with a machete, they'll probably get confused and not know what to do. And this is perfect because surprising players makes them more likely to make the kinds of mistakes that the heroes make in these slasher movies. Second, Spend time developing the personalities for the NPCs in the adventure and really building the relationships with the PCs. In a slasher game, some of the key NPCs have to get killed off early, sometimes off screen, before the PCs see and confront the killer. The Mound in the Yard includes a relationship chart for the GM, but I'd still suggest the GM take some notes and find out what really motivates their specific players and include those kinds of moments in the adventure. Finally, don't ignore those fright rules and darkness penalties from your favorite RPG. Serial killers and slashers need to surprise their victims in order to be effective. So enforce those sanity rolls and fright checks, and when a PC fails, always stun them for a few seconds, which is just enough time to let the villain escape into the shadows or get up really close to their victim. The PC should almost never see the killer clearly until it's too late. Well, that's the summary of The Mound in the Yard. If you're looking for a slow burn horror adventure that will surprise your players, you might want to give this one a try. You can download it for free at oneshotadventures.com. If you enjoyed this video, click the like button and I'll see you soon. Until next time, don't hide in any closets.